From Brussels to Damascus, a long-awaited nuclear deal struck between Iran and world powers is welcomed as historic. The six-month agreement will see Tehran curb its enrichment program in exchange for the partial lifting of sanctions. Historic, perhaps, but as a mistake. That's the reaction in Israel, where Prime Minister Netanyahu has rejected the deal as a unilateral success for Iran. Throughout the talks, Jerusalem had warned its allies against striking any partial deal. And Malians vote in parliamentary elections this Sunday amid fears of rebel attacks. In some northern cities, UN peacekeepers and Malian soldiers outnumber voters. Turnout appears to fall short of the presidential election held this summer. Hello, I'm Nadia Shabi. Thank you for watching France 24. Historic, a breakthrough, an important step towards security and peace. Reactions are pouring in this Sunday after six world powers clinched a temporary deal with Iran on its nuclear program. In exchange for curbing its activity, Tehran has been given temporary relief from economic sanctions, an agreement that's been 10 years in the making and that marks a first rapprochement between Iran and the West. Let's take a listen to US President Barack Obama reacting to the deal. And we have pursued intensive diplomacy bilaterally with the Iranians and together with our P5 plus one partners. The United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia and China, as well as the European Union. Today, that diplomacy opened up a new path toward a world that is more secure. A future in which we can verify that Iran's nuclear program is peaceful and that it cannot build a nuclear weapon. Well, for more on the reaction in Washington, we're joined now by our correspondent, Philip Crowther. Philip, hello. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it's a goal Obama has been pursuing ever since he came into power. How much of a victory is this for him? It's a great diplomatic breakthrough for the Obama administration as a whole, though in public what we're hearing also uh, from the highest ranking members of this administration is cautious uh, optimism. Uh, this has been called a first step by both the president and also by uh, Secretary of State John Kerry, who of course traveled to Geneva uh, to be part of those talks at the very uh, last hour. Uh, still though, this is a major diplomatic breakthrough uh, for the president himself, because take this back to 2009 and to the first inaugural address from Barack Obama. Uh, that is where he said that he would uh, extend uh, the hand of diplomacy to Iran. That is something that he mentioned again in his statement from the White House uh, last night. Uh, and of course, also remember that at the end of September, there was that really, really big diplomatic breakthrough. That was that uh, highly symbolic phone call between the two presidents of the United States uh, and Iran. That was uh, at the end of September. Now, there is caution, absolutely, yes. Uh, this is, after all, only a six-month uh, initiative deal and a deal that can be broken off uh, at any moment if Iran doesn't do what the United States and the other uh, negotiating partners uh, want it to do. Uh, but still, the conclusion for the United States uh, is this one, and this is a quote from the U.S. president from last night. He says that this deal cuts off Iran's likely paths uh, to a bomb, and uh, that is precisely uh, what this deal is and was supposed to be about in the first place. And is it a deal that will go down well with everyone in the United States? Not necessarily, and uh, certainly not abroad either, because uh, what we found out today from the Associated Press is that there have been uh, a lot of secret talks between high-ranking diplomats uh, in the Obama administration uh, and from Iran over the last few months, and that very few countries were told about this. Uh, Israel is one of those countries that was not told about these talks that were happening evening, even before the UN General Assembly and that initial phone call uh, between the Iranian and the US presidents. Uh, Israel certainly is not happy with this deal. Uh, you, uh, We'll have heard from uh, Israeli uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying this is a historic mistake. What you can expect today, I think, is a phone call between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, maybe tomorrow, but that is an urgent co co call that will have to be made. Uh, also here in the United States, there are quite a few members of Congress, largely Republicans, who don't necessarily agree with this deal. They've been working hard uh, on putting in place new sanctions, and indeed there are still plans to produce new sanctions uh, against Iran, and uh, it goes to show that domestically, uh, this might not be quite as easy as it seems, and internationally, it won't be quite as easy either. Philip Crowther reporting there from Washington. Thank you very much for that. Well, as Philip was telling us, this shift in international relations has also sparked concerns among Iran's Arab neighbours, but most vocally in Israel. Henry Brown has more. Amidst the smiles following Iran's nuclear deal, one country's reaction stuck out like a sore thumb. 
isolated and angry, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu harshly criticized Sunday's historic agreement between Iran and world powers. What was concluded in uh, Geneva last night is not a historic agreement. It's a historic mistake. It's not made the world a safer place. Like the agreement with North Korea in 2005, this agreement has made the world a much more dangerous place. The hostile reaction came as Israel saw months of diplomatic efforts being swept aside. Netanyahu even paying a last-ditch visit to Moscow a few days before the deal to try to convince Russian President Vladimir Putin, but to no avail. Meanwhile, others in Israel sounded a more optimistic note, with President Shimon Peres pointing to the fact that it is an interim deal. The success or failure of the deal will be judged by results, not by words. I would like to say to the Iranian people, you are not our enemies and we are not yours. The United States sought to reassure Israel, saying that the deal was only the first step in a long process and would help to make the region and Israel safer. Well, moments after striking that agreement, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry was already looking ahead to the, quote, even more difficult efforts to implement its content. The U.N.'s nuclear watchdog has stepped forward and offered its help in probing Tehran's atomic capabilities. Our international affairs editor, Armand Georgian, tells us more about what happens next. Well, it's an interim deal for six months, so we'll have to see about what happens later and perhaps then decide whether whether the, the deal is historic or not. But certainly so far, um, it's a, an agreement that is agile enough in its wording for both sides to be able to sell something at home. So for President Rouhani, who gave a televised speech a few hours ago, uh, for him, Iran's right to uranium enrichment has been accepted. And uh, he also uh, was able thus to play on this idea of national pride. Uh, remember, he was elected pledging to bring Iran in from the cold diplomatically, so now he can claim to have done that. Meanwhile, the West can argue that it didn't explicitly recognize the right to enrichment in this text, uh, and also that it got other key concessions on the heavy water reactor in Iraq on the two plants at Natanz and Fordo, which will now be subject to daily inspections if the UN inspectors uh, want to go in there. And the idea is that any breakout to nuclear weapons could be detected very quickly in Natanz and in Fordo. Now, among the key players that helped broker this deal was France. And to tell us more about the country's role in these discussions, we spoke to François Nicolot, the former French ambassador to Iran. Well, one can believe that I mean, the, the, the agreement, the final agreement, incorporates all points that uh, France has raised in the process. Obviously, Fabius was not happy uh, with the first draft, and this, this is why uh, the, the last meeting was a kind of a failure. But now the French are happy, and everybody is happy. As you have noticed, uh, um, Zarif, the, the Iranian foreign minister, gave a big hug to, uh, to Fabius at the end of the meeting, which shows it a way of saying, OK, let's forget the, about the past. I mean, now we're entering a bright future. Uh, one has to understand that Rouhani has the trust, I mean, uh, of, of, the, of the supreme leader. The supreme leader trusts him. They, they've, they've been knowing uh, one another for 30 years, you know, and uh, the supreme leader knows that Rouhani uh, will be faithful, will apply faithfully his instruction. He, will, he won't go beyond the red line that the Supreme Leader has drawn, you know. And uh, starting for the, from this point, I mean, for Rouhani, it's an immense success. Uh, this will reinforce his legitimacy, will reinforce his authority. And uh, frankly, from the first declaration of the Supreme Leader, one can see that uh, uh, Khamenei is fully behind Rouhani. Even within the conservative uh, camp, even the Pas Daran, for instance, you have Pas Daran, you know, at the head of uh, very important uh, companies, enterprises in Iran. They have an interest in having these companies, I mean, uh, be prosperous uh, work, and the sanctions were, were very difficult for them. So they have a, they have a chance. In, 
also to uh, they also to deliver some U.S. troops will be allowed to stay on in Afghanistan after the 2014 withdrawal date. That's the core of a security deal backed this Sunday by a grand assembly of Afghan chiefs and politicians who urged President Hamid Karzai to sign the pact by the end of this year. However, already Karzai has warned that the agreement will only go ahead under certain conditions, putting off the signing until after April's presidential election. I mean, while reacting to the Assembly's endorsement, the Taliban have issued a statement condemning the members as, quote, criminal slaves who will not benefit from an illegal and insignificant pact of slavery with America. Syrian activists report over 70 people killed after clashes between rebels and soldiers in the opposition-held suburbs of Damascus. The observatory also says that at least two Syrian media activists were killed as they covered the battle. President Assad's forces have been blockading rebel-held areas to pressure fighters into surrendering. Egypt's interim president has issued a new law this Sunday regulating protests. A move that has come under fire from rights and political groups that say it will undermine freedoms and stifle all opposition. According to the new bill, protesters will have to receive advance permission from the police before gathering. This law comes 10 days after authorities lifted a three-month-long emergency order that granted sweeping powers to security forces. Down with the gang, that's the slogan chanted by tens of thousands of Ukrainians who marched through Kiev this Sunday, bearing the EU's starry banner in a pro-Europe rally aimed at denouncing President Yanukovych's policy U-turn earlier this week. On Thursday, the Ukrainian government stunned European leaders by announcing it was suspending preparations for the signing of a key pact with the EU next week and instead was reviving trade and economic talks with Russia. Malians are voting this Sunday in parliamentary elections aimed at cementing a return to political stability. This after months of armed conflict in the north of the country. Well, heavy security deployed ar around polling stations and low turnout figures betray fears that the election could be sabotaged by rebel attacks. So far, a few incidents have been reported, but as yet the poll has been largely peaceful, much to the relief of newly elected President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, who expressed his joy this Sunday, stating that Mali is back on its feet and moving forward. France Vanquette's Nicolas Germain is in Bamako with this report. This parliamentary election is an important step in the return to political stability in Mali. It's actually the second step. The first step was, of course, the presidential election this summer. I've come to this uh, polling station here in Bamako to ask uh, the president of the polling station what the turnout is and what it's like compared to the presidential election this summer. What is the turnout and how does it compare to the presidential election? At the moment, the turnout is at 8%. So there is a great difference with the presidential elections, in which there was a turnout of around 30%. So the turnout is very low compared to the presidential election. What the Malians are doing today is that they're electing 147 new lawmakers who will have a huge task ahead of them because the security situation in the north is still very fragile. You still have pockets of jihadists who have been able to carry out several attacks since the end of September. Swiss voters have chosen to put competitiveness before fairness, rejecting a state proposal to cap the wages of any company's highest paid manager to 12 times that of the lowest paid worker. In this Sunday's referendum, 65.3% voted against the limit, saying no in all 26 of the country's cantons, or states. While backers of the 112 initiative had argued that imposing a legal limit on salaries would ensure greater even-handedness while still giving top bosses the chance to earn more money than, for example, government ministers. And with that, we're leaving this edition. But for more, you can visit our website. That's france24.com. We'll find more on all the stories we've been developing here. Stay tuned. There's more coming up.